The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, just furiously rifling through a set of urology puns here uh, because, of course, (laughs) on tonight's episode, we are talking about uh, screening for prostate cancer, a very serious topic, but we always like to have at least one pun on the show, so I got to look them up, Paul, and why not do it last minute? Um, Feels right. Yeah, so with me, uh, if you're watching the video, you can see I have my my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, and a mystery co-host who we will announce in a minute. So, uh, Paul, before we tell them about our co-host and uh, read their bio, can you tell the audience what is it that we do on The Curbsiders? Happy to, Matt. As per usual, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you mentioned tonight, we learned all about prostate cancer and primary care. And to tell us more about our guest, about what we talked about, I am thrilled to ruin the mystery immediately and say that we are joined by Wonder Kid, um, producer extraordinaire, Dr. Beth Garbs Garbatelli. Garbs, how you doing? Doing great. So yeah, we had we had a fantastic uh, discussion today with Dr. Peter Bayich. Um, he's a urologist and a sexual medicine specialist at the Center for Men's Health in Cleveland Clinic's Glickman Urological and Kidney Institute. He earned his medical degree from the University of Toledo College of Medicine and completed his urology residency at Loyola University Medical Center. Um, he followed this by completing a fellowship in andrology and male genital reconstructive surgery at Rush University Medical Center. So before we get to that discussion, do we have any any good Euro puns, Matt? Sure, I got I got some I got some good ones, Paul. Let's see what you think. Uh, so, Paul, you know uh, you know what they say when you get accepted to urology school? Let's just pretend that's a thing. <laughs> no, tell me. <laughs> You're in. Uh, it's not bad. Um, and Paul, you know I did go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to school for many years studying urology. I never told I there, there's many parts of my life, Paul, that you don't know about. And uh, you know what they gave me after all that school? I do not. A PhD, Paul. <laughs> 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 a reminder that this and most episodes are available through VCU Health uh, for free CME at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Paul, it's late. And uh, I did want to mention that Dr. Bayich mentioned that he had consulted for Endo Pharmaceuticals as an advisor and for Coloplast Corporation receiving consultant fees. Uh, those relationships have ended and they were not relevant to the topics discussed on tonight's episode. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, listeners, did you did you ever wish that life came with a user's manual? You're working a hard job as a busy clinician, so you're trying to balance a family, maybe, friends, taking care of yourself. Maybe that falls by the wayside, but BetterHelp, what I love about it is it makes it easy to get yourself into care because... You don't have to go anywhere. BetterHelp is all online therapy and they're going to match you with a licensed therapist so you can start finally doing that work on yourself. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist and if things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It could not be simpler. There's no waiting room Rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash curb. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash curb. This episode is brought to you by Birch Living. If you're a longtime listener to the show, you know how important a good night's sleep is. It, it can be helpful from a cardiovascular standpoint, memory formation, clearing out neurotoxins, But above and beyond that, I just, I love sleeping more than I love almost anything else in this world, which is why I'm thrilled to talk to you about Birch mattresses. Birch sent me a mattress and I I can tell you that every night's sleep that I have is the best night's sleep that I've ever had. It allows me to enjoy my favorite hobby uh, in the best possible way. And 
Birch mattresses are stylish, they're comfortable, and most importantly, they're environmentally conscious. The non-toxic mattresses are made right here in America and are crafted with natural and organic materials that have been sustainably sourced. We'd like to give all of our listeners the ability to enjoy a deep and restful night's sleep with a new mattress from Birch. They source only the finest quality materials like organic fair trade cotton, organic wool, and natural latex to create luxurious mattresses designed to give you the best night's sleep. Every Birch mattress is constructed with non-toxic materials with a focus on breathability to keep you cool at night. Plus, Birch knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. That's why they're offering a 100-night risk-free trial. Try out your new Birch mattress, see how your body adjusts, and if you decide it's not the best fit, you are welcome to return it for a full refund. Birch mattresses are shipped directly from their manufacturing facility right to your door for free. The mattress comes rolled up in a box and it's super easy to set up. You just open the box, the thing basically explodes, and then boom, you have a mattress. Birch is giving $400 off all mattresses and two free Echo Rest pillows at birchliving.com slash curb. That's birchliving.com slash curb to get $400 off all mattresses and two free Echo Rest pillows. So, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. It's time to bring the audience in. I know we've been talking for a while off air. Uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and give them a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. Sure. So uh, my name is Peter Bayich. I'm a urologist in the Center for Men's Health at Cleveland Clinic. Um, the primary focus of my practice is male urinary and sexual dysfunction. And as part of that, I see a lot of men uh, who are prostate cancer survivors. I also do a fair bit of general urology. As far as hobbies and things I like to do outside of work, uh, my wife and I are avid travelers, so we try to take at least one international trip a year and, and enjoying now starting that up again after a couple of years of not getting to because of COVID. Yes, thank goodness. Uh, largely, uh, we've been unlocked again, which is which is fantastic. Well, you know, I know we have a limited amount of time with you, so instead of our normal like getting to know you stuff, uh, maybe the audience can seek you out elsewhere. But we want to get to a case because I know they really want to hear a lot about prostate cancer screening. So, uh, Garbs, would you do Absolutely. the honors? So. Uh, this case is from Cashlack Memorial. Theo is a 61-year-old man who comes into your clinic for a checkup. His medical conditions include hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He takes an ARB and a statin. Uh, he has not been in the clinic for an annual since he's been in your patient panel, and you don't really know much about him as he was a patient inherited from a retired physician. He wants to know if he can get a PSA. He, his friend recently got diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he's been concerned about his own risk. So to kind of kick it off, um, I just wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, incidence and burden of prostate cancer in the United States. You know, is the epidemiology for this disease changing? Yeah, uh, so great question. So so prostate cancer is one of the most common uh, cancers that men can get. Um, most men, you know, will get some uh, prostate cancer if they live long enough. So the vast majority of those are um, non-life-threatening. Okay, I tell my patients that they're more likely to die with it than from it. Uh, but what's what's really important to know is that there is a smaller but very significant um, um, subset of prostate cancers that are life-threatening. So um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about what populations I recommend screening in. You know, based on primarily on our urologic um, guidelines, and we'll talk about some of the differences between that and other. Um, statements that have come out in the past 10 years. Yeah, that's a big part of what we want to know about uh, because it, I think if we could select, if we could know who was going to have a prostate cancer that was going to matter as far as their quality of life, their mortality, um, that would be great. So hopefully you'll be able to give us a little bit of a better idea how to do that. And I guess we should just jump right into the fact that, you know, we were mentioning earlier that a lot of primary care doctors have maybe given up on screening or are screening way less than they were 20 years ago and not knowing, not, not being comfortable with the PSA tests, the sensitivity, the specificity, like, so how should we go about selecting groups? I know that the USPSTF is re recommending shared decision-making, but what about for, uh, your, the urology society? What, what are the recommendations there and how do you select? Yeah, so our our guidelines uh, recommend for men aged uh, 55 to 70 who are of average risk, meaning that they do not have a strong family history of prostate cancer, and also they are not African-American, 
that those men should be screened with a yearly PSA um, or potentially every two years. Uh, for men under age 55, we typically recommend screening uh, starting at age 40 for a subset of men who either have a strong family history or are higher risk for the more dangerous types of prostate cancer, like African-American men. And in general, uh, for men over age 70, we do not recommend routine screening. Um, now, as we'll also talk about, I think, a little bit more, one of the most important factors to consider is when, when considering a man for screening is what, what his 10-year life expectancy is. Because as I tell my patients, prostate cancer is a condition that uh, changes and evolves in general at a slow rate, okay, on the order of 5 to 10 years, not 5 to 10 days. So if a man in his 70s is, you know, he develops prostate cancer and otherwise dies from cardiovascular disease, it's unlikely to impact his lifespan or his quality of life. But if that same man, you know, uh, has a strong family history of living to his 90s and he's fit and otherwise healthy, it might even be considered in that patient. So it really is individualized. But in general, 55 to 70 is the age in which we screen with PSA. Just to interject, we do want to emphasize that the AUA, like USPSTF, does have the same emphasis on a shared decision-making approach um, for deciding to just screen a patient with a PSA. Um, so going into that discussion, kind of um, for patients between the ages of 55 and under 70, so 55 to 69, um, emphasizing that there are harms, there are risks, explaining what those are. And then from that point, also emphasizing that the greatest benefit for screening would be in that age range. Peter, I, I think what we're talking about, at least in this particular discussion, screening for, for prostate cancer, we're, we're talking about using the PSA. And I just feel like that's sort of a it's a weird test. I don't know. I'm, I would be curious to know how you how you discuss with your patients in terms of exactly what it's looking at and what its significance is. Yeah. So uh, PSA or prostate specific antigen is a substance naturally secreted by the prostate. And the, the purpose of PSA is actually to liquefy the semen. So after ejaculation, the semen is a little bit more viscous and solid. And then the PSA actually... Um, liquefies it into more of a, you know, a less viscous fluid, which facilitates uh, fertilization, uh, et cetera. So um, this substance, PSA, like I said, naturally secreted in the prostate, but in um, a variety of, of disease states and uh, conditions, the PSA may be elevated. So for example, prostate cancer, there's an overproduction of PSA. Uh, in other states like infection or after instrumentation of the prostate, let's say a catheterization or things like that, it may be also elevated transiently. Uh, so there is some nuance on how to interpret it, um, and I'm happy to you know get a little into a little bit more detail. But that's that's generally how I explain it to patients. I think this is a tricky thing. I mean, generally, in the past couple of years, the way it's been going, patients ask me, "Do I need to be screened for prostate cancer?" Uh, largely, I've been saying, "Well." You know, um, we've we've really there was a time where everyone was getting prostate cancer screening with PSA testing. We found out that the test uh, isn't as good as we would like with you know identifying who's going to have a significant cancer, and there are some risks associated with even just getting a biopsy to find out if you have cancer or not. Um, so, with with that discussion, like, do you do you talk about okay? So if we get the test and it's above this level then this may happen. Um, can you can you tell us about how that part of the discussion goes? Does that, do pe people have follow-up questions for you when you're telling them about the PSA? Yeah, yeah. So I think the first thing I always do is consider the patient's age and whether or not they mean the, meet the general screening criteria. And then I consider mm -hmm. their 10-year life expectancy. And if they seem like somebody that's likely to be around beyond 10 years, that all factors into my counseling. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, whether or not they choose to be screened depends on a lot of things. Some of it may be their threshold to live with something going on in their body that they don't know about. Some people, they very much want to know if there's any possible thing going on. Um, there are other people that say, you know, if it's not causing me some sort of symptom, I don't even want to know about it. Okay. So, Part of that conversation that I have may also um, entail you know, asking them whether or not uh, they would want to do something about it if it was detected. Um, so it, it's not the easiest conversation to have, but in general, 
particularly if they have a strong family history, you know, uh, did, did their father or uncle have prostate cancer? How old were they when they were diagnosed? Did they, you know, uh, die from prostate cancer? All of those things are important to determine kind of how worried we should be. Um, I think that, you know, it's a mistake to just say we should never check it. And it's a mistake to say that we should biopsy every single person with a PSA elevation. Um, so you know, I can kind of walk you guys through a little bit of how I manage patients in certain scenarios. Happy to discuss the cases that we have here. Um, but, but yeah, there is, there is some, it's a very individualized discussion, uh, that takes a lot of uh, the patient factors into consideration. I was, I was going to ask Paul, like, uh, do you want to throw out any, any scenarios? How do you think is the best way to approach this? Like less than four, four to 10, greater than 10. Like, I, I'm not sure if you have a, a way that you split it up or you think we should approach it. No, I, 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 I think I would love to hear Peter's just sort of broad framework for actually how he deals with, it. I think it's, well, what the expert on the show. Sure. So let's say a patient walks in that has a single PSA value of 4.5 and it's flagged on your computer as elevated and you don't have any other records. Um, I think that's a, that's one patient where we may want to do a little further investigation and see if this is, um, a change or if maybe they had a PSA a year ago somewhere else, we want to try to get their records. Um, we also may want to consider repeating a PSA after about a month to see if it was just some, uh, you know, transient increase. If it goes back down, then that is to me not concerning and would not merit a, a biopsy. Uh, so when we look at the overall trends over time, we don't want to see a rapidly rising PSA. You know, there, there are some varying opinions on what is considered abnormally you know, quickly rising, but I would say in general, uh, if a PSA is rising into that elevated range and continues to rise, that that may be somebody you may be a little bit more worried about. Uh, but if it's flagged uh, elevated, but it's been stable for several years, and let's say they have known BPH, that can be a potential reason why it may be elevated. That's somebody we may be a little bit less worried about, particularly if they don't have a strong family history. Um, so it's, it's never wrong to repeat it. And there are some additional tests that we can use in certain men, um, if we want a little bit more information, um, a little bit about prostate biopsies, I can get into that. Um, so the traditional way of performing a prostate biopsy to rule out prostate cancer is by a transrectal approach. This is an office-based procedure that takes about, you know, two to three minutes. Um, we insert an ultrasound probe into the rectum, give a little bit of local anesthetic to the prostate. It's generally not painful. It just kind of feels like they're getting their prostate checked. Um, and then we take 12 samples from the different areas of the prostate where cancer is most likely to appear. Risks of that procedure are bleeding, um, which is generally pretty mild. They typically hold their blood thinners. Um, so there is some risk to stopping blood thinners for a period of time in those patients. Uh, there's a risk of urinary tract infection, probably about 10%, despite the fact that we give antibiotics during. And there's uh, you know low but serious risk of sepsis, which is probably in the range of one to five percent. Um, you see some you know uh, rare reports of things like erectile dysfunction. I would say that that is exceedingly rare, uh, definitely less than one percent. Um, really, uh, those are the main risks um, that I think patients need to be aware of. There's no risk of you know, uh, permanent incontinence or anything like that. There may be some transient worsening of lower urinary tract symptoms due to maybe some swelling of the prostate, but that's pretty uncommon. So it's not something we want to take lightly. Uh, we want to carefully select the patients that undergo biopsy. Uh, but it's really important to know that there are some safer alternatives, both, you know, um, currently available, kind of also on the horizon at certain places that may not yet be offering it. And, and, and probably the, the main option there to be aware of is a transperineal prostate biopsy, which is also performed with an ultrasound probe in the rectum. But instead of passing biopsy needles through the rectum and into the prostate, which runs the risk of introducing uh, you know, uh, rectal bacteria into the urinary tract, this type of biopsy passes the needles percutaneously through the skin. So the risk of sepsis, although it's not zero, is, is almost zero. Um, and it really removes a lot of that, uh, infectious risk. Now there's still some risk of bleeding, some of those other risks we talked about, but in general, it's considered a much safer procedure. And I think probably 
five to 10 years from now, the vast majority of biopsies in the U.S. are going to be done that way. I want to swing back to PSA for a minute just because I, I have a lot of patients. PSA comes back 0.5. I'm like, great. Z- PSA 0.5. Sometimes you get 2.5. Year later, 3.5. Okay, still less than four. In the U.S., I, we have some international listers, but in the U.S., generally four is considered our cutoff. Like above four, you consider biopsy. I, I think what I was seeing in the literature a lot is like four to 10 is where this gray area, you're not sure if you should biopsy or not. Above 10, it seems like most people would be worried enough to biopsy, I guess, depending on what else was going on clinically. Um, this is my understanding as a primary care who has not been doing as much PSA testing just because, um, it just seemed, it was kind of out of, like when I came up, it was, they were telling us really not to do it too much. Now I'm starting to hear again that, uh, and my urology colleagues, I'm noticing they're doing a lot more. They're being much more thoughtful about who they biopsy and other pre-biopsy testing, which I do want to talk about. So can you, can you shed some light on that, the, the spectrum? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think you're not alone. Um, what we've seen is is a lot of folks um, just don't check it at all, um, and either that's because that's what the way they were trained to do it, or you know maybe they don't feel comfortable with some of the nuance related to it. Um, you know the original USPSTF task force recommendations were to just not use it at all, um, and you know what we saw after that, we did see an increase in the number of patients that were presenting with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, and since then, those recommendations have been modified to more of a shared decision-making approach in certain populations. Like I said, there is there are some differences there with with our u- urology guidelines where we do recommend screening for men in those age groups. Um, in general, I would say that anybody with an elevated PSA should be evaluated by your urologist. Simple as that. Um, and 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 you know, it's good for you to know what the some of the nuances are as far as when we biopsy and when we don't. But at the end of the day, you don't need to feel like you necessarily need to be a master of that, uh, that's our job. Okay. So, um, I generally consider anybody with a PSA above four or, you know, in certain populations that, um, normal may, you know, or abnormal may even come lower. Um, but I would say definitely anybody over four, you may want to think about whether or not they need further evaluation. Um, once you're getting above 10, that's kind of danger zone. You need to be worrying about the possibility of, if they have prostate cancer, maybe it's even outside the prostate. Um, so if we can get these guys earlier when their disease is organ confined, uh, it's a much better prognosis if they do have the real deal prostate cancer that we want to treat. So I can talk a little bit about some of the additional tests that are useful. So first of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of your uh, comments about the PSAs that we get that sometimes are really, really low, you know, 0.1, 0.1. Oh, nine, you know, sometimes even lower in guys who have not had prostate cancer treatment. Uh, it's important that folks know that the prostate is a androgen sensitive organ. Okay. So if a guy has hypogonadism, uh, his PSA is actually going to be falsely low. And this is extremely important. And anybody, for anybody managing hypogonadism, that when you start testosterone replacement, if you see the PSA jump suddenly, it does not mean that you have caused that patient prostate cancer. Because like I said, prostate cancer is a slow forming, slow growing type of cancer. It didn't form overnight, but you are now replacing or repleting, you know, that testosterone that was absent. And all of a sudden the prostate, that PSA factory is back in business. So that, uh, level is naturally going to go up. So, um, the, this is, this is something, you know, that's called, we call that saturation hypothesis for, for, for testosterone and, and PSA. Um, so the, the way I manage it, and I manage a lot of men with low testosterone is whatever their new PSA is after their eugenatal is their new baseline for future comparisons. Mm. Okay. So I, I do short term, if it jump, really jumped up, I do short term follow up. you know, two to three months. If it's stable, we continue to monitor not, you know, I think the gut reaction a lot of times is stop it. Oh my God, you know, need a biopsy or you're never going to be on testosterone again. That that's generally the principle. So when I see a PSA of 0.05 or whatever, I'm thinking, does this guy have any symptoms of hypogonadism? You know, that that's kind of where, where my mind starts going. Um, the, now the, cool. there's, there's a lot of active investigation going on in that area. I don't want to say that that is necessarily an accurate biomarker for low T, but just so you know, 
sometimes we find guys that maybe they had prostate cancer, but their PSA was falsely low. So that's why, although it is not in any guideline that I am aware of, I still do find a digital rectal exam to be extremely useful. And I have, I have diagnosed men with really bad, um, poorly differentiated prostate cancers that are non-PSA producing by digital rectal exam. So I do think that that's a valuable tool. Um, it may not be something that every primary care doc incorporates into their practice, but uh, I think for, for my practice, it is something that I do on all new new patients with a concern about PSA. Okay. Now that I've given that little detail about the androgens, I think uh, it's worthwhile talking about some of the additional tests um, that we may uh, consider, unless you have any questions about that. I just had a comment, which is, Paul, this is kind of neat. Like we, we are, every primary care knows that if someone's on finasteride, dutasteride, that you should consider that their PSA is going to like be lower, you mm -hmm. know, and that if they stop it, it will go up. I just hadn't thought about like the person with, you know, uh, hypogonadism just from, because they're, they have hypogonadism, not because we've given it to them iatrogenically. <laughs> right. So I hadn't considered that um, converse situation. So pretty cool that you pointed that out. Um, Actually, just can I ask a very basic question? Yeah, okay. please go ahead. I, I, but this is more along the lines of sort of, you know, that the test comes back normal. What and This is very basic, but what, are, what is the recommended interval for, for at least your end of things? Like how often, if it comes back, do we just say, shoo, and then we're done? Or is this like an annual test or where do we go from there? Annual test is my opinion. So our, um, our guidelines say that a interval of every two years may also be acceptable. Uh, I think logistically in my clinic, it's harder to get somebody on a two year <laughs> schedule and maybe more likely that they get missed and fall through the cracks. So uh, yeah. I generally do <clears throat> yearly prostate cancer screening if they're in that population. And if they, if they don't have a less than 10 year life expectancy. This episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. It is the most festive time of the year, and HelloFresh is here to help you make the most of every moment. From holiday hosting to dinners during busy weeknights, you can count on HelloFresh to deliver fresh ingredients and seasonal recipes. It is also the season for saving money wherever we can, so HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. You can use those savings for holiday gifts or to treat yourself. And if you're anything like me, I, I barely have time to breathe under the best of circumstances, and then with the holidays around the corner, I'm even busier, so I'm, I'm so grateful to have HelloFresh just delivering these pre-portioned ingredients right to my doorstep, and the meals could not be easier to put together. It's, it saves time in a season when I need time the absolute most. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Curb18 and use code Curb18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that is HelloFresh.com slash Curb18. Use code Curb18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This episode is brought to you by Pattern Life. Pattern is the number one physician-recommended provider for disability insurance because at Pattern, they use data-driven approaches to streamline the process for securing a policy, eliminating wasted time and confusion for doctors like you. First, head to patternlife.com slash curbsiders and request your free quotes directly from their website. Second, you're going to review your options with a trusted advisor and ask any questions that are on your mind. And lastly, you can secure a policy and take on your future with confidence. Work with Pattern and leave as an educated, fully insured physician with peace of mind regarding your financial future. So visit PatternLife.com slash Curbsiders. That's PatternLife.com slash Curbsiders. I had a question about the cancer history in, in families. You know, I know folks will ask about prostate and I, I was kind of surprised that um, at the BRCA connection. So, I mean, I just wanted to know if you could speak to that. Do you, do you recommend sort of getting a full cancer history or at least like a little bit of an expanded cancer history when you're trying to figure out who you should recommend more aggressively to like actually get the PSA test if they're on the fence? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I generally focus my family history questioning on urologic cancers uh, as a urologist, but it is important also to know about any significant um, other family history. BRCA is a, a big one that there is an association with. Um, so anybody that has a, a lot of cancers in their family, I may be a little bit more aggressive with um, asking them those questions or, you know, screening them if they, if they answer those questions um, in a way that makes me a little bit more concerned. 
I want to get back to the the other test because we've teased it a couple of times now. So you were going to say, okay, we, we were talking about some cases of PSA and how to interpret that based on their hormonal um, status. So tell us about what other tests can we use to try to figure out that person that we should be biopsying if we're if we're not sure. If somebody comes in with an elevated PSA, you want to think about what other reasons there might be for PSA elevation. Okay. Do they have an indwelling Foley catheter? Did they just have a urologic procedure? Um, do they have a UTI? So a simple test that you could check in somebody with an elevated PSA, particularly if they have some sort of urinary symptoms is a urinalysis. Okay. Urine culture, make sure they don't have a UTI. Um, if they don't have any of those other symptoms, you know, and, and you think this might be the real deal, always reasonable to repeat the PSA. Okay. Give it at least two to four weeks or so. Um, there are, there are a lot of, um, thoughts about certain things potentially causing the PSA to rise transiently. For example, some people recommend to patients not to ejaculate for 24 hours prior to uh, getting their PSA checked or to avoid, you know, long bike rides and things like that. There's, there's yeah. generally not a, a uniform <laughs> consensus on these things, but you know, if it was a re really unusual rise, it's not wrong to ask them, you know, did you just have sexual activity shortly before then? And I've definitely had some patients that had it repeated and it ended up being normal. So mm -hmm. no, no, no reason, you know, no reason that you shouldn't just repeat it. Other options are things like f checking a free PSA. So a free PSA is, uh, is indicated for men that have a PSA between four and 10. If they're outside of that window, the PSA is not validated for those uh, PSA levels. What it's going to tell you is it's going to give you a percent free PSA, and then it typically comes with a kind of uh, risk of prostate cancer based on that. So it's a little bit more useful information. Um, however, I, th I find that this test is becoming less and less uh, used, and part of that is because it does not differentiate between the low-risk, low-grade types of prostate cancer, which generally, as we'll talk about, are managed with active surveillance and not do not necessarily rec you know, require invasive treatment, and the more serious types of prostate cancer. Um, a newer test that I use in my practice uh, that, that, that does differentiate those is called ISO-PSA. So ISO PSA similarly um, tries to risk stratify patients who have a PSA over four. Uh, and the way it does so is by looking at different isomers of PSA and the ratio of those isomers to each other. And what it'll tell you is, does this uh, ISO PSA risk threshold fall above or below kind of the uh, danger level? And if they're in the high risk category, there's a, 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 a about a 50% chance that they have a real deal uh, prostate cancer, um, at least uh, intermediate or potentially high risk cancer. Uh, and if it's below that, then it's a pretty good indicator that they do not um, have a serious type. Now, it's not perfect, but it's a useful tool. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention um, that I think is, is used quite a bit um, is the prostate MRI. Okay. Um, in general, in my practice, I use prostate MRI more to determine where to biopsy. Uh, rather than whether or not to biopsy, because it isn't perfect. You can get a prostate MRI that might be normal, and there's still probably about a 25% chance of prostate cancer, even in those patients. I'm just going to say on a radiology rotation I was on last year, I remember looking at, I shadowed with a fellow who's doing prostate MRIs, and I was like shocked at how heterogeneous they looked, and it just seemed like really challenging to read them. I mean, I know they're really good at that, but I could just imagine that it kind of just shows you areas of abnormality that might be worthy of a biopsy. I can, I can definitely see it can be some gray area. Yeah. So, so the, the prostate MRIs, there's a, um, kind of, uh, category system called PIRADS where the higher the number, the higher, or the, the more, uh, scary the lesion is. So in general, uh, PIRADS four and five lesions, we find concerning one, two, and three, we don't really worry about as much. Um, but this is, these, these, um, assessments are best done by a radiologist very experienced with prostate MRI. Um, you know, there's been some publications that show that lower volume centers that don't do a lot of these types of studies may be more likely to, to miss clinically significant lesions. Um, so it's not a perfect test, just like many of these other tools, but in, in the right patient, it is very useful. I, I primarily use it in patients who have already been biopsied and we, um, despite you know, the PSA being elevated, we didn't find any cancer. And a lot of times it ends up that the, there is a lesion in an area that we otherwise wouldn't be 
checking um, or maybe a something small that we might have missed. And then later we can come back and do a focused biopsy on that. I wanted to uh, just bring us back to our case here. So we, we had this 61-year-old guy coming in for a checkup, asking about PSA testing because he, he had a friend who was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. So he's in the range. If you go by the the, the AUA, he's 50, in that 55 to 69-year-old range. We haven't told you anything about him to make us think his life expectancy is less than 10 years. So I think he's someone it would be reasonable to get a PSA test for. I, I think that um, probably the audience is just going to, you know, wonder uh, about like, how, well, how do I know? Because some guidelines are saying shared decision making, the, the AUA guidelines are saying to do it. There, there were some kind of dueling articles in New England Journal in April 2020 and um, June 2020, which I can link to in the show notes. I read them. And even the one that was more on the side of being against PSA testing was just like, I can tell you there is no right answer to this. And what we should be trying to do is find the people that are, you know, most likely to benefit and try to find, you know, who's going to have the high grade cancers that should get a biopsy and, and should get treatment. So, um, you know, if, if the, I'm just I'm thinking the audience is going to be like, I'm more, I'm confused. What should I do? I think it's, I, you know, Paul, we always ask for like a test that tells us exactly what to do. <laughs> the one test, yep. <laughs> just tell me what to do. I just want to know what to do. But uh, it seems like maybe there's not for this situation either. Um, so I think maybe we should move on. And should we give this patient prostate cancer best so we can talk about, I, I mean, I do want to talk about active surveillance because I know that's something that I don't understand so well. And I, I would love to talk about that. But am I Paul, you know, I, I tend to jump the gun on these things. Am I missing any big things that we need to get to before? I mean, we talked about biopsy, complications of it. We pretty well talked about some of the pathways. So do you want to biopsy this patient or what, what, what should we go next with this? <laughs> I, I love that you still managed to skip ahead. We still didn't actually diagnose him. So we're just going to write the biopsy then? No, I'm saying, well, we could move, we could move the case. So let's Good. say his PSA came back at uh, 7 and we did an ISO PSA and we were worried maybe that he could have a high grade. Uh, and maybe just for good measure, we also got an MRI of his prostate sure. to figure out where we wanted to biopsy. And now, uh, Peter, he's seeing you. Um, and what if, what if he came back with a lower grade prostate cancer? You know, what might that discussion be like? And talk us about the active surveillance. The first thing I'll say is that you may have a hard time getting insurance to pay for an MRI uh, in somebody who has never had a prostate biopsy. Unfortunately, it seems like it's getting a little bit better. Um, but what what I found, at least in where I practice, is that a lot of times they won't uh, reimburse for that um, if it is done in somebody who just just for an elevated PSA. So. If you had that information, it's useful because it it may allow us to do a targeted biopsy and, and, and increase our confidence that the biopsy result is accurate. Uh, but in this patient with a elevated PSA, elevated ISO PSA, uh, I would definitely proceed with a biopsy. I would personally counsel him on the um, option of transperineal biopsy, which like I said, is a safer option that may not be available everywhere. Um, it is a little bit more involved in the amount of time that it takes and the potential for discomfort. So we, we typically do those, uh, with nitrous oxide in the office. So anyhow, uh, that's the way I would do it. If I had the MRI ahead of time, great. If there's any suspicious lesions on that, we would target those. And in addition to that, do a standard template of random biopsies, just in the event that there's some prostate cancer in the areas that did not show up on the MRI. And if he, if he came back with a, um, concerning Gleason score, um, let's say, I, I actually, I don't know the Gleason score well enough to say what would be a borderline score would, would, uh, so can you maybe talk about that and like, what would be, uh, what would be a Gleason score that might warrant active surveillance? Like, let's say this person really didn't want a radi radiation or prostate surgery, um, but we're going to give them a prostate cancer. So can you tell us like, what would look a low risk score look like? Sure. So for those that maybe don't know, uh, the Gleason score is a scoring system that's based on, you know, pathologic examination of prostate tissue removed during a biopsy. And what they do is they look for the two most common patterns uh, that are visualized in the sample. And that's where they assign the Gleason score, which is, let's say, for example, 
three plus three being the three and three being the two most common patterns that they found or three plus four, et cetera, up to, you know, five plus five. Uh, so the higher the number, the more aggressive appearing the cancer is. And we generally, um, group based on the Gleason score, we group into five grade groups. So one is the, I tell patients, one is the best one to have grade group five is the worst one to have in general grade group one, which is basically Gleason three plus three equals six prostate cancer is generally managed with active surveillance for the vast majority of men. Okay. People do not die from Gleason six prostate cancer unless it converts to a more serious type or Maybe there was a more serious type that was just missed on the biopsy and we didn't know it was there. Okay. But the actual Gleason 6 prostate cancer does not spread or metastasize or anything like that. Um, the opposite side of the scale, so the grade group four and five cancers, those are the really nasty ones. Those are usually like Gleason 8, 9, 10. Um, those are the ones that are real deal. You know, those need to be treated. Active surveillance is not an option. Now, the ones in between are the ones where I think there's the most nuance. So grade group two and three um, prostate cancers or what we would consider intermediate risk. That's where we really factor in the patient factors. You know, if it's a 70-year-old guy with, you know, other health issues who's a grade group two, he might be more likely to be managed with active surveillance than somebody who's you know, 40 with, um, you know, high risk cancer mutations and uh, with the same Gleason score. So we, we factor all those things in, uh, in how we counsel the patient on the various treatment options. But in general, active surveillance is reserved for the less aggressive, less dangerous types. Um, active surveillance, it, the, the key word there is active. That, that, that doesn't mean we're just watching it and, you know, or not doing anything. We actually actively monitor the PSA starting usually, there's no universally agreed upon protocol, but for example, I check PSAs at the beginning every three months. Um, I typically check an MRI at the three month mark, particularly if a patient has not already had an MRI um, to get an idea of whether or not there may be a lesion that I didn't sample with the biopsy to make sure I'm not missing something more serious. Um, and then typically we repeat a biopsy every couple of years to make sure biologically that that uh, cancer is not progressing or getting worse. So there, there's a lot involved. And for a you know compliant patient who's going to show up to his follow up and get the tests, it's a great option. But if you have a patient that just you, you know, admittedly or you know maybe, maybe you don't think is going to follow up very well, that may not be the best um, choice, particularly if they're if they have a higher risk um, type of cancer. Um, and then, you know, there are a number of treatment options depending on the PSA and the uh, grade group. And those include things like surgery, radiation, et cetera. This is great. You know, I feel like I'm understanding this whole world a lot better already. Uh, Paul, any follow-up questions or comments? No, I, I think I've got most of the script it would look like. I would love to actually hear how you discuss and I, I think you touched on some of this. So if, if the, you don't have a whole lot more to add, that's okay. But the the lower risk cancers, because I feel like you hear, like, and I've heard patients say the C word. And I think, you know, a lot of our patients view cancer as a sort of big, gigantic, and not a sort of organ specific process or, or, or very nuanced thing. And they hear cancer and they fear the worst. So I think the idea, I think you touched on being active about the surveillance probably provides some reassurance. But is there anything else that you add to that discussion to kind of reassure them that it is not a, an insane thing to just watch things for now? Yeah, I, I mean, there are a wide variety of different types of patients out there, right? So there are some folks where if you, it doesn't matter if they are the lowest, lowest risk type, maybe they had, and this is not an uncommon scenario, we do 12 biopsies, maybe the, one of them showed a, if the one core, there was like 5% of that one core had Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer, right. and they are like, de you know, devastated, and they want their prostate out, and you know, uh, so... It can be a challenging conversation to have, but really the thing that I emphasize in those patients, and, th and that specific patient I just mentioned, we would consider that very low risk, assuming that their PSA was also low. Uh, likelihood of dying from prostate cancer in that scenario is you know, very close to zero within the next 10 years. Um, the thing that I emphasize is that uh, people die with this type of prostate cancer, not from it. Um, I talk to them about what the most common reasons that men die are, and you know it's not Gleason six prostate cancer. Um, the bottom line, though, is that some folks 
maybe you're just not the best candidate for that um, frequent follow up and 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 you know the frequent PSA testing and and some of them may choose to have treatment. Now that guy specifically who has very very low risk prostate cancer, that would be somebody I would be trying very hard to talk out of having treatment. But some you know a lot of times it's more borderline. So I think emphasizing, like I said, that it's not a life-threatening cancer, that it changes and grows on the order of five to 10 years, not five to 10 months or five to 10 days, really allows people time to think about it. And just saying that, you know, you can always change your mind. We're going to start with repeating another PSA in three months, and then we'll see where things go. And a lot of times when they see that maybe the PSA is stable or even goes down a little bit relative to the last one, they may be a little bit more reassured. It gives them more time to think about it, do research, et cetera. Um, so it, a lot of this is just um, reinforcing that, that nothing needs to happen as an emergency. You know, take time to think about it, do the research. We give a lot of reading material, engage the you know family in the discussion, I think is really important. Um and, and just really make sure they understand before they make a decision that may be irreversible. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. Should we move on to uh, a case of like more survivorship? Uh, let's say we, uh, we ended up uh, choosing op- active surveillance for our patient. And, you know, you talked about following the PSA every three months, at least early on and repeating an MRI in three months. And, uh, biopsying again every few years and let's say he does well and never ends up requiring treatment for it um so let's let's move on to a case and beth you want to give us give us a new case to go by yeah let's say that you know it's a few years down the road we are taking care of theo's friend who had cancer now he is um post cancer treatment for his prostate cancer um i mean i guess i see this uh, I've been seeing this, you know, where sometimes folks in places where there's less specialists, they may have seen an oncologist or a urologist or a specialist for a period of time, and then they fall off and they're mostly being followed by primary care. So I'm just really curious, uh, you know, how you approach general survivorship in folks who've had pr- prostate cancer um, and what, you know, do you do more regular PSA screening for them post, um, post-treatment and things like that? Yeah. So great, great case. Great question. So first thing I want to emphasize is that anybody who's had prostate cancer should be having PSAs for life. Okay. Because we do know that these cancers can progress. They can recur even after treatment. Um, so it's not uncommon that I, you know, see a guy show up who for, for another issue who had his prostate removed 25, 30 years ago and hasn't had a PSA in over 10 years. Now the vast majority of those guys are fine, but it's important to continue to monitor that. And in anybody who's had their prostate removed, the expectation is the PSA should be undetectable. If it's detectable, even if it it comes back as normal because it's less than four, if it's detectable at all in one of those patients, that's concerning that there may either be, have been a positive margin or some cancer in a lymph node. And, you know, um, it's just something to be aware of. So, um, Other things that are important to know is that no matter what type of prostate cancer treatment uh, a man undergoes, there are some similarities in the side effects that he might experience from that, okay? I think most providers know that, um, let's say, prostate removal, for example, can impact sexual and urinary function, but some folks don't know that even radiation can affect those same things, okay? The timeline of when those side effects may occur is a little bit different. With surgery, there's more upfront. And then for most men, there tends to be recovery of those things, maybe not 100%, but 80% or more. Um, The um, radiation is more likely to cause those same effects down the road. Okay, so it can take five to 10 years, but I I frequently see guys that had those types of um, treatments that, that now are experiencing those issues. So... Uh, what what does that entail? Well, uh, erectile dysfunction, probably the most common sexual dysfunction that we see in this population. And on the urinary side, um, urinary incontinence for primarily for uh, men who had their prostate removed. And the radiated guys tend a little bit more likely to have like overactive bladder type symptoms, frequent urgent urination, um, you know, burning with urination, things like that. There can be acute toxicity, and late toxicity. Um, So those are all things that those men may experience. The reason why this population is different than your run-of-the-mill blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes guy that shows up with erectile dysfunction is that in the 
treated prostate cancer population, this is neurogenic erectile dysfunction. Whereas um, the, the vast majority of other patients you see out there, it's arterial insufficiency that causes ED uh, due to you know atherosclerosis of the penile arteries. In this population, the essentially the nerves that run alongside the prostate that are responsible for erectile function um, are damaged. Uh, even even if they don't have to be removed for the cancer, they have to be moved aside to remove the prostate. Or when the radiation is delivered, those nerves are you know abutting the prostate, so they are bound to be damaged uh, from the radiation therapy. So, if the signals don't get from the brain to the penis to tell those arteries to dilate and bring the blood in. Viagra is not going to work. Cialis is not going to work or Tadalafil, Sildenafil. Um, so this can be a pretty challenging population to treat. And I generally recommend that if they're not responding to conservative therapies for their sexual or urinary issues, that they be referred to a urologist for further management because they can be pretty difficult to treat. I had not heard about neurogenic erectile dysfunction. I, I had no idea. So that's a, that's a great pearl. And uh, certainly I will not be trying to treat that with um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, I, I, now I understand why they wouldn't work. It, it's not every patient. You know, a lot of these guys have both issues. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's pretty uncommon to find a guy walking around there in his 60s that does not have some degree of cardiovascular disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they may or may not respond to a PD-5 inhibitor. Uh, but it's important to know that if, if these drugs are not working, you should be thinking, could this be neurogenic? In etiology, could it potentially be hypogonadism contributing? We know that PD5 inhibitors in a man who is hypogonadal work better when combined with testosterone replacement therapy. So if the T is low, they are less likely to respond to PD5 inhibitors. In addition to getting that referral to urology, do you recommend um, for any of these p- folks to be sent to you know pelvic PT? I'm just like curious if that might be helpful to as an adjunctive? Great question. So um, one of the other groups of patients I see in my practice regularly is men that have pelvic floor dysfunction that causes things like pelvic pain, genital pain, you know, and sometimes um, uh, stress urinary incontinence, particularly in the post-prostatectomy population. So uh, a man in general uh, relies on his prostate and his internal urinary sphincter for continence. And and another name for the internal sphincter is the bladder neck. When the prostate is removed, the prostate's gone and that internal sphincter or bladder neck is essentially gone. So they are completely reliant on their external urinary sphincter, which is the voluntary one that we can control and do Kegel exercises and things like that. Um, So some men may not have adequate uh, control of that muscle to be continent after prostatectomy. So it's very common for there to be transient urinary incontinence after that type of procedure, which generally resolves for most men quite quickly, but in some men can persist and be permanent and require further treatment. Uh, The other thing, those same nerves that I mentioned that run along the side of the prostate that can be damaged either during prostate removal or with prostate radiation, are the nerves that innervate the external sphincter. So if there's nerve damage and the sphincter muscle is denervated, it may not coapt sufficiently and they may leak urine. So that's, you know, um, pathophysiologically what happens in those patients. Pelvic floor physical therapy can be very useful in helping to retrain that muscle and expedite that man's um, restoration of continence. So It's not something we necessarily universally use for every single patient. I know some centers do, um, but in patients who are not making progress with the Kegel exercises that we teach them, we send them to the PT to uh, make sure they're doing them correctly. So that's that's one population where the pelvic floor training is valuable. Uh, Another population I see not infrequently is men who have had um, radiation do tend to develop uh, dysfunctional pelvic floor muscles later on. And I find that some of those men can have things like burning with urination, um, pelvic pain. Um, Sometimes it may even contribute to some of their frequent and urgent urination. And there are different types of pelvic floor exercises, more like stretching, lengthening types of exercises that could be beneficial for that as well. And I have to imagine, especially if they're in your office, you're screening and asking specifically about these symptoms. As I'm thinking things through, I wonder how often these are just volunteered and how often we should be asking more aggressively, at least in the primary care setting, about uh, symptoms of erectile dysfunction or urinary dysfunction, that kind of thing, because it, it may not come up, I think, unless unless you specifically ask, because some, some of these are such sensitive topics. 
Yeah. And I mean, this is an area obviously that I specialize in. So I'm asking every single patient about it. I don't, I don't think that every single primary care doc out there needs to know the nuance of which prostate cancer treatment causes what specific type of dysfunction. Yeah. But anybody that you see who has been treated for prostate cancer, two simple questions you can ask. Are there any sexual issues that you're having that you're concerned about? Are there any urinary issues that you're having that you're concerned about? And if they've had treatment for prostate cancer, they're kind of like by default, a kind of a complex urologic case. And I think that's a reasonable person to refer. You don't need to stress yourself out about trying to figure out what is the best solution. I mean, certainly regular things like if they're having urinary symptoms, you know, an alpha blocker or something like that is very reasonable. But particularly if they're not having the improvement that they're looking for, that would be a patient to refer. You had the question about the hormone blocker. I wonder if you could just hear about sort of generally before we move past that. I know we, we, we're we not expected to know sort of the side effect of every medication, but I feel like that is a broad class we see fairly commonly. Is there anything uh, we should be specifically thinking about with, with patients receiving those medications? Yeah, so as a little bit of a, a background on when um, we use androgen deprivation therapy or hormone blockers, um, this is generally reserved for men that have advanced prostate cancer. Um, the first group where you might see this is in men who have more aggressive types of prostate cancer that are newly diagnosed, who may have chosen to undergo uh, radiation therapy. Um, for the more serious types of prostate cancer, the radiation therapy is oftentimes combined with a limited duration androgen uh, deprivation therapy as a sensitizing agent or radio sensitizing agent to make the radiation more effective. Depending on the status of the cancer, that might be six months, it might be two years. Okay, so during that time, you would expect this, this is essentially, uh, you know, chemical castration. So you would expect all of the symptoms of hypogonadism. You know, a lot of these guys get hot flashes, they have lack of energy, lack of sex drive, etc. Um, and then in that population, they get off of it. And depending on the patient, some people, you know, get their testosterone levels back and, and they don't have those symptoms anymore. But some people do actually have persistent libido issues, persistent sexual dysfunction, persistent things. So that's definitely a population that if they're continuing to have issues that you may want to refer for further evaluation. Um, another population is those who have metastatic or advanced prostate cancer who maybe have undergone treatment and have a continuously rising PSA despite that. Those patients may be um, treated with lifelong uh, androgen deprivation therapy. And some patients, unfortunately, the cancer may change or adapt and you know uh, become non-hormone sensitive. We also call that castration-resistant prostate cancer. And for those patients, it gets pretty complex, but there's a variety of you know immunotherapy agents, chemotherapy agents that are definitely outside of my uh, scope of practice. Um, but th those are the situations where we may be turning off uh, the testosterone to try to help control the cancer. And that is, it's important to know that those treatments, that as a primary treatment is not considered curative, uh, but is meant to keep the cancer at bay. What are you following for side effects as, as patients are on those? Any tests in primary care that we should be ordering? Uh, I think bone density or metabolic labs of any kind, hormonal testing, anything like that? Yeah, great, great question. You know, we could probably do an entire hour talk on um, the treatment of advanced prostate cancer and all of the different agents that are used. Um, so, I, you know, it's hard for me to give just a blanket recommendation um, despite that. But, I, you know, I think a lot of the things that we commonly see checked in those pop populations are things like bone density, liver function, and things like that. So with that, I think it's time to get take-home points. Um so let's let's get some take home points. Maybe a couple things that you want the audience to remember from this talk tonight. And thank you again so much for all your time and teaching. This has been fantastic. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. It's really um, a great opportunity to to chat about this stuff. Um, you know, I think as far as take home points go, I think it's important for folks to know that although it didn't get as much publicity those initial statements that said that by the USPSTF task force that said that we should not ever check PSA i mean that that is no longer the case i mean those those statements have been revised they did not get as much uh, news surrounding them um, so so don't be afraid to order a PSA um, you know you don't necessarily need to know all the nuance of it but if, if the patient has meets those criteria for screening that we talked about today and you talk to them about the plus and minuses of screening, if their life expectancy is greater than 10 years and you check a PSA and it's elevated, 
it's never wrong to send them to a urologist for further evaluation. Okay, that does not mean that they are going to undergo prostate cancer treatment and be permanently, you know, negatively impact their quality of life or that they're going to become septic or something like that. If nothing more, just for the counseling and the pluses and minuses of proceeding with the biopsy, further testing, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of new things out there. You know, the, the space is continuously evolving. Biopsies are becoming safer. Treatments are becoming safer. We now have focal therapy, you know, which is an option that's gaining traction that is you know, also being investigated further. It doesn't necessarily have the same side effects as the his more, you know, treatments that we've done previously. Um, the biopsies, like I said, are safer. There's other tests that can be used to increase our confidence about whether or not treatment is indicated. Um, so the other thing I want to emphasize is that for any patient that you see in your practice who has been previously treated for prostate cancer, make sure you're asking those important but sometimes difficult questions. Are you having any trouble with urination or continence along with that? And are you experiencing any bothersome sexual dysfunction? Okay. You got to make sure these people know that this is not the way they have to live their whole life. I cannot tell you how many um, patients that I've seen who spent decades thinking that they just had to live their life this way in diapers for the rest of their life. There are a number of effective treatment options available. We can restore quality of life to these patients. Um, there's a lot of great options for them. So it's just really important to know that. We will start the outro music here. <laughs> that is great. Thank that, you. That was fantastic. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> Great. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, it's time for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, we'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. Paul, we're going to have to make some promotional materials with Ali as part of our like third our third recording, our third co-host, essentially, because he's been on like every episode recently. Um, Ali the cat, that is, for the uh, people who are not watching the video. We're committed to high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. You can also send an email to the curbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available through VCU Health for free CME at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to Beth Garbs Garbatelli for writing and producing this episode and to our whole team. Technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I've been Beth Garbs Garbatelli. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>